Good morning and welcome to Journey Church. If we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. If you happen to have your hands free, would you put them together and welcome those who are online this morning? God bless you guys. Uh, grateful for our internet ministry. Uh, Mary Jo's actually at home sick. I'm coming off of a cold. It's been going around. I hope you don't get it. <laughs> it's, it's not been good. So uh, bear with me if I struggle a little bit today, but I'm excited to be here. How about you guys? You warmed up a little bit? You ready for the word? So over the past couple of weeks, Pastor Adam's done an incredible job of kicking off the new year. He's been reminding us of some of the most important things that we have in our life, our relationship with God the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's been an important kickoff to the new year. Um, that relationship is cultivated through prayer, fasting, reading the word, living a lifestyle of holiness. These are all some of the basics of Christianity, but they really do matter. And many of you have kicked off this year in fasting. If that's you, I thank you. I commend you. That is not the easiest thing to do. Give yourselves a big round of applause if you've been engaging in that fasting and going for it. Just super proud of you. He entitled this series, Why Revival Waits. So it really prompted me to go a little bit deeper into studying both revival and, you know, why sometimes it takes longer than we would think in our own life or corporately as well. So it brought me back to the definition. What is the definition of revival? There's two that are listed when you Google it. One is the improvement in the condition or strength of something. How many of you need a little bit of revival in some area of your life today, right? That improvement and strength or condition. Isn't it amazing what a miracle God is, even when you get something like a cold, right? The first couple days, you feel like it's death. I couldn't get out of bed. It was awful. But daily, God, by his miracle working power, is continuing to heal me from within. And I'm on like day eight, and it is almost gone. And I bet you you give it another day or two, and it'll be all the way gone. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? He built in this miracle working power inside of us where we're created by our very nature to be revived. How many of you have ever got a cut or something? Wasn't it horrible? You get a big cut, it's not as bad as those paper cuts. Oh my goodness, like a paper cut hurts worse than the big ones. But, but you look down and hey, here's a scar, right? And then before you know it, that scar's healed up and like, wow, there's miracle working power in our very DNA. We were meant to be revived. Another definition is literally to bring back to life. To bring back to life. If we use biblical terms or theological terms, that could be expressed as to be born again. How many of you are here are one of those born again kind of people? Any born again people in here? I remember making fun of them when I was young, and Mary Jo used to pick on them, those born-agains, right? Now you're one of them. You're one of those born-agains. I love it. Corporately, there's also a form of revival where the Holy Spirit moves in the lives of a number of people at the same time where groups of people get changed and even societal change can occur. Our nation and its people, our world right now, even our churches are in desperate need of revival. Can I get an amen? amen? But one of the things that I've come to realize in life is that individual revival always precedes corporate revival. And that's where I want to go in today's message. I want to talk about how can you be revived that individual aspect of this corporate revival that we all believe for. Father, I thank you and I praise you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the one with the power to transform. You are the only one who died and came back to life and gives us that hope that we can join you in heaven one day and spend eternity with you. Father, we love you. We sang to you this morning. We lift you up today. Would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us ears to hear? And would you give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives? In Jesus' name. And everybody says. Amen. As you get older, you're afforded the opportunity to look back at different stages of your life. It's not something you could do when you're young. Everything. You've got a big future ahead of you, right? But as you get a little bit older, you could start to look back at those different chapters of your life. And I've been a believer in Jesus Christ for over 30 years now. 
30 years. I mean, that's, that's, that's a long time. I mean, I think back to what life was like before it, and believe it or not, it feels just like yesterday. I can remember like it was yesterday what it meant to be a person who was not born again, a person who was not a believer in Jesus Christ. I can remember that feeling of fatherlessness. I could remember that lack of purpose. I could remember that pain. I could remember that emptiness. I could remember trying to fill all of those voids in all the wrong places with all the wrong things. And for me, that mostly led to a life of drug abuse, alcoholism, and pain, not only for me, but for the people that were around me that loved me so dearly. Anybody, a, a, a young lady walked up to me this morning and was speaking of her mother and saying like, I, I'm powerless. She's still addicted. She could feel the pain. You know, when somebody's trapped in any kind of a sin or addiction, it only doesn't just affect you. I, I remember saying things like that, like, to me, I'm, why do you care if I'm getting high? I'm not hurting anybody else. Oh, gosh. Our sin affects everybody around us. And it happens in the life of both believers and unbelievers, but I want to speak of that state before you came to know Christ. Because some of you might be here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And some of the things I'm saying might already be resonating with you. You can feel that emptiness. You could feel that pain. I grew up without a father. These were things that were real to me and acute that I tried to cover up in many different ways, right? I was living life firmly in the grips of the devil, yet oblivious to the fact that I was on the highway to hell. How many of your friends are on the highway to hell? If we want revival, we need to keep believing for it. We need to keep acting on it. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but let me stay focused on us. There was a day on May 31st of 1992, May 30th of 1992, where I walked into Hollywood Hills High School Auditorium. There was a pastor standing up there on that stage that day. His name was Dominic Avello. And for some reason, I didn't hear the words of Pastor Dominic Avello that day. I heard the words of Jesus coming through and touching me. I walked in that room that day and I said, I don't want anybody to get near me. I don't want anybody to hug me. I don't want anything to do with God. The only reason that we were there is we felt guilty because her mom had invited us to church like 52 times and we didn't go. And we showed up that day and all of a sudden I heard words of hope. I had words of freedom. You mean I don't have to live this way? You mean there is a father in heaven who actually does love me? Are you kidding me? I would never experience that in an earthly sense. I don't have to live a life of drugs and alcohol. I don't have to try to fill pain in all these different ways. There's truly a God who loves me. And for some reason, that very morning, it became so real to me that I walked out of that place and I'm like, oh my gosh, everything is different. Everything has changed. I encountered the one and true and living God, and he changed everything. Did that mean everything got better immediately? No, right? Some of you have been, I see a lot of the, the believers who have been around a little bit, and they're like shaking their head like, no, nope, not everything was perfect. So if anybody comes up to you and lies and says, oh, the day that you get saved, you're going to be perfect from that point on, hallelujah, Jesus, <laughs> that pastor is a prophet liar, Right? He is not telling you the truth, but you have the power to get through those things in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ being at work in your life. I discovered a path of hope, freedom, and fulfillment. Ultimately, I discovered salvation. If that's you who are here today, man, I pray it's not my words that come through, but I pray it's the words of the Holy Spirit that touch your heart and give you hope. And that maybe, just maybe, at the end of this service, when we give an invitation to come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, like me, will run up here and say, man, that's me. I need him as my Lord and Savior. I walked out of that place in newness of life. Now, most of my Christianity has been marked with a steady passion for his presence, a passion for his word, a passion for his people. But there's been times where you go through those different seasons of life where there's also been those moments where I felt very disconnected from God, where I felt far from God. And I don't know what place you find yourself in as you walk through these doors. I pray you're at that fired up place. I pray when you walked in here, you're like, man, I am fired up. I am on cloud nine with God. And I pray that that lasts. But if you didn't, I'm here to tell you that there's hope for you as well in this place. If it feels like your Christianity is kindled out, 
There's one thing I've even learned in the natural. We live out on a, a big property with a bunch of trees and a bunch of underbrush and things that have needed to be cleared over the years. And we've created many fires out there to help eliminate some of that brush, right? And you go out there and you have a big blazing fire one day. And I mean, man, it is crazy. You're like, I, I'm a little scared how big this fire actually is, right? And you go out there the next morning and it's usually kindled out. But there's always like a little bit of smoke still coming up. You look at it, it looks like it's dead. There's all this ash that's there. There's not even a flame. But if you go out there and you begin to stir it up the next morning and you move it around just a little bit, all of a sudden some little flames start to pop back up. Maybe a little wind comes and blows and helps you just a little bit. And before you know it, that flame's burning again. So if you're here today and it's kindled out in your life, Pastor Adam and the other team members who will be speaking in the weeks ahead are sharing with you ways in which you could begin to fan that flame again. If the spirit is alive in you, you are alive in Christ. There is hope for you yet. Don't let the devil get the victory. Don't let him tell you it's all gone. That faith can be rekindled in your life. We'll talk about that a little bit more today. In AA, they have this saying, <clears throat> for those of you who enter the rooms of AA and get a taste of sobriety and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you go out and begin to use again, it messes up your getting high. Some of you are shaking your heads. You know what I'm talking about. So what I mean about that in the natural is you use drugs a lot, you used alcohol a lot. Maybe it seemed fun for a season. You get into the rooms of AA, you learn the principles, you meet other people who have gotten sober, you meet other people whose lives have turned around, even your life has turned around and you go back and take that first drink again. It is a terrible experience from that point forward because you've experienced, you've got a taste of what it was to know sobriety. Same thing with Christianity, if you think about it, right? Doesn't it say taste and see that the Lord is good, right? And once you've gotten a taste of who he is, when you go back out there and you start to sin again, and some of you might be in that place at this very moment, it messes up your getting high. It messes up your sinning, right? See, before you get saved, you're dead to sin and dead to your trespasses. And you can go out there and do all kind of crazy stuff and have no remorse about it, right? But once you've been saved, the very fact that you're starting to have remorse is a sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. Sometimes that slightly precedes your getting saved, by the way, right? But once you're saved, if you're feeling that guilt and remorse, that is a sign that you're saved. Even if you've drifted from God, there's something alive in you that is saying this is wrong, right? So even if that's been almost burnt out, almost kindled out, God can revive that and fan those flames back into life. Hallelujah, Jesus, he is a good, good God. The biblical analogy there also is that you were not created to be lukewarm. I like coffee, right? Anybody here a little bit, old, you like coffee? Anybody like coffee? How about some of you, any young people already drinking coffee? No, one or two of them? I see some of them every now and then I'll be in there in the, in the cafe and there'll be like an eight-year-old coming up and grabbing some black coffee. They'll be like, yeah, this is good. Like, who's your mama? I'll be like, Let, let's talk about this. You know, like. Some of y'all on that Celsius trip though, like my daughter, sorry, mom. <laughs> be getting cases of Celsius coming via Amazon. Come on, Jesus, right? Avoid the Celsius, kids. Sorry, I got off on a tangent. But uh, I, you know, I like frozen coffee, you know, believe it or not. Frozen coffee is some good stuff, like iced coffee. I never thought I'd like it. I'm like, wow, but you, you get a taste of some frozen coffee, it's actually some pretty good stuff. You get some nice, like, hot coffee. You go to Starbucks, you go somewhere. I'll be ordering it extra hot. I like it extra hot. But, man, you let that coffee sit out there on the counter for a few minutes and it gets to that lukewarm state, I mean, like, oh, gosh, it is awful, right? It's awful. My coffee maker's kind of broken, so if anybody's looking for a birthday present for me in a few months, <laughs> it comes out and I got to go put it in the microwave for like a minute just to get it to where it's supposed to be, right? You're not meant to be lukewarm. 
Your coffee's not good lukewarm, your soup's not good lukewarm, your dinner's not lukewarm, and you are not meant to be lukewarm in Christ. It tells us in Revelations 3, 15, 16, I know your deeds, you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold, so that because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. So God doesn't like lukewarm coffee either. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? But maybe you walked in here today and you're feeling pretty lukewarm. How do we begin to fan those flames back to life? That's what I want to talk about today. The Bible describes King David as a man after God's own heart. Yet we all know from the story, there's this moment where he fell horribly and sinned with Bathsheba, took it so far in an effort to conceal his sin that he actually has her husband killed out there on the battlefield. The prophet Nathan approaches him and confronts him. And this psalm that we're going to walk through is a bit of how David felt during that moment where he's feeling the acuteness of the pain of his sin, and he's asking God for forgiveness. This psalm, Psalm 51, you could use as a framework for your prayers. We'll walk through it, and I'll go through some of the details of it. But man, what a great outline for you in times where you're struggling. He opens up with the following words, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. If you're here today and you're lukewarm, if you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ who is caught in the midst of sin, cry out to God and ask for his help. Lord, you are good. You are merciful. We serve a God of mercy. Hallelujah. He doesn't take us out instantly. He gives you an opportunity to repent, and David's acknowledging that at the moment of some of his deepest sin. God, would you have mercy on me? I deserve no mercy. You deserve no mercy. David deserved no mercy. Yet he's approaching the God of mercy. Would you blot out my transgressions? He's saying, would you forgive me? He began with a prayer of repentance, a great way to approach your God and King. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Again, you and only against you have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Let's break that down just a little bit. The first part's kind of obvious. He's asking for forgiveness. He's asking for cleansing from his sin. I acknowledge my transgressions. The two worst people you could lie to are God and yourself. pretty much stinks to lie to other people too, though. You know, it's not, not good at all, right? But sometimes we lie to ourselves about our own sin. We begin to justify it. We begin to counter it okay. We begin to make excuses. We begin to blame it on others. Say, it's okay. It's not that bad. We lie to ourselves. Some of you coddle your sin like it's a teddy bear. I like it. I don't want it to go away. I love it. I can't live without it. Can't live without my addiction. I can't live without this other person in my life that that person is not supposed to be in your life, by the way, right? I, I, I can't live without this. I need to get in mind. Whatever it is, we'll justify it. I almost feel I'm probably dead wrong theologically here, but the next thing he says, against you and only you have I sinned. Remember I said earlier, like sin, alcoholism, addiction, all kinds of things are actually a family issue too. Maybe that was his way of justifying to a small degree. He certainly sinned against God. That was the worst sin that he did in that whole picture, right? But he put a lot of damage and hurt on a lot of other people around him too at that moment, right? He killed a dude. He cheated on the guy. He cheated on his family. He destroyed lives. He messed up a bunch of people. Don't minimize or diminish what you're doing either if you're doing stuff like that as a believer or not. You are creating pain in the lives of others and you need to, you know, come to account for that. You need to accept it. You need to ultimately later, if you overcome it, you need to go back and make amends to some people. 
You need to fess up when you mess up and go back and say, man, I messed up, man. Would you, you know how long, how far that goes oftentimes? Just that simple thing, man, I messed up. You try to go in your closet and get forgiveness from God and not get forgiveness from that other people. Now, they may not accept it. That's okay. That's on them too, right? But if you do it with a pure and right heart, there's a lot of power in that for you to overcome and get that healing at the same time. So I don't know if that's an example of him trying to justify his actions in that. But again, it is the biggest sin, no doubt, is against God, right? I mean, he sinned against God. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against her husband. He sinned against their family. He sinned against his own family. The weight of that sin was deep, as ours is too. He's done evil at God's sight. But Lord, would you hold me blameless? What a bold thing to say. Even in our own sin, Lord, would you hold me blameless? Would you forgive me? Jesus died that we could have the kind of forgiveness that David is talking about in that moment. He took on our sins. He's the one that provides tender mercies. He's the one that declares you not guilty. May you find life in him. When we are caught in sin, Leonard Ravenhill is quoted as saying, a sinning man will stop praying, a praying man will stop sinning. We start to run from God, like Adam and Eve. We put on our clothes, we go, we hide, right? We, so maybe that disconnection from God, if you want to start reconnecting with God, as you approach him the way that we're talking about and come back to him in prayer. A sinning man will stop praying. A sinning man will stop reading the word because it convicts him. A sinning man will stop coming to church and start blaming their problems on everybody else, including Adam's bad. He's a terrible pastor. He's speaking bad. I'm not going to that church no more. Those people stink. <laughs> you know, one of the sad things I've noticed about 50% of the people that leave the church, they have to find an excuse for it. So they start blaming the church. But the problem actually, sadly, oftentimes is them. Amen. Guess what, people? Not just with church. Most situations in life, you take yourself wherever you go. If you got issues and you're in a relationship and you get divorced and you blame it on the other person, guess what? If you still got issues, you're going to bring it into the next relationship. And guess what the common denominator is? Oh, sorry, I said it. I can say these things because I'm not the full-time pastor no more. Hallelujah, Jesus. You get mad at him later. But believe me, it's true. When you want to leave a job, when you want to leave a relationship, when you want to leave your church, you start blaming it on those things. But let me tell you, 50% of the time, it's actually you. Dead serious. I'm not lying. We need, to, we need to accept it. And if we need to change, we need to change. We got issues. It's okay. I got issues. You got issues. But bring it before the Lord. Man, did we get off on another tangent. Hallelujah, Jesus. A sinning man will stop praying. The late Tim Keller, great man of God, recently passed. The secret of freedom from any enslaving sin is this. You have to worship him. You have to sense his greatness. You have to be so moved by who he is and what he has done for you because when you taste him, you will lose your appetite for sin. It will mess up your getting high. It'll mess up your sinning. David acknowledged his sin before God. That is the beginning of transformation. Five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in my sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire the truth in, in, in your inward parts and the hidden part of you will make me to know wisdom. Important theological point here. You and I are born in sin. We are born apart from God. We are desperately in need of a savior. The only path to salvation is through his son, Jesus Christ. When you are not a believer, you are dead in your sin. You are dead in your trespasses. You need revival. You need to be born again that you may find life, right? These are some of the fundamentals of Christianity. So he's repeating what you would later see in different places of scripture where it says similar things, right? You are born in sin. I'll go, I'll go get myself in trouble again. Are you born gay? Probably. Why? Because you're born in sin. Was I born an addict? Yes, I was born in sin. 
Was I born X? Whatever it might be. Yeah, we all have this tinge of sin deep within it, and we want to try to justify it and define it as something else, but no, it is sin. Go read Romans chapter 1. You can't justify it away. You can't act like it's not sin. You can't do whatever. It says you were born again. You need, you, you're, it says you were dead in your sin and trespasses. You were born in sin. You need to be born again to overcome these things, right? That's what it says in Scripture. We are dead in our trespasses. David's acknowledging that right there in verse 5. We are all born in sin. We are all in need of a Savior, right? He says in verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you that you could wash away our sins as far as the east is from the west. Thank you, Lord, that you can transform us from the inside out. Thank you, Lord, that even if we are believers and we are trapped in sin, you can transform us from glory to glory, that you can continue to make us whole through this process called the sanctification process, which is at times painful. The next verses are the ones in which I want to land in just a second. Verse 10, I'm almost there. I think about that verse. I think about what we've read so far. And I also think of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, he's confronted with God. He sees God for who he is for the very first time. And his response, much like David's, is, oh, what a sinful man I am. Oh, what a sinful man I am. Lord, would you touch me and make me whole? And God, by one of his angels, goes up and touches Isaiah's lips with coal. Man, his sin is washed away. He's made whole. Make me hear joy and gladness that bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face amongst my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. One of the things I've noticed in life is that when you finally start to overcome these things, God will use your deepest tragedies as an opportunity to bring hope to others. You can think of many groups here over the years, like a divorce recovery group that was here, that the many stories that came out of that of people that found such pain in the midst of that difficult moment in their life, shared it with others, and they all came out there more hopeful. They came out there more strong. It just seems to happen that way. He will use your greatest pains, turn those greatest tests into your testimony so that you can make a difference in the lives of others, right? Here's the one that, man, in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my getting high, in the midst of almost losing my wife, my relationship with my kids, my job, my family, and everything, I would cry out in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Other words say, renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, O Lord, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. There's songs about that one. (laughs) Cast me, I can't sing like Adam does. I'm jealous of that guy. (laughs) Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Renew the right spirit within me. Some of you need that today. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. If you need that today, those words are for you. Receive them today. Receive them. Ask God. Cry out. Use this as a prayer. We'll do it before we leave. Once you do that, something happens. It happened to Isaiah. It happened to David. And I believe it will happen to you. Listen to what happens after that moment. Verse 13 Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness, Lord. Open my lips, and my mouth shall flow forth in praise, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a contrite heart. To you, O God, you will not despise these things." When Isaiah encountered this, when his sins were washed away, the next word out of his mouth were, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. What happens is when you truly get a taste of who God is and you see others that you love that are still trapped in these things, there's something inside of you that compels you to go tell the world about it. In the old days, we used to look what the Lord has done, right? Those old charismatic people. Like we'd sing songs like that. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He, whatever, just in time. I can't even remember all the verses, right? <laughs> you might remember them, so I'm singing them. But something happens within you and all your mourning, all your pain turns into joy. Turn my mourning into dancing. May he do that in this place today. 
May he turn your mourning into dancing. May he turn your pain into joy. And then would you use it? So when we go from individual revival, and I say individual revival precedes corporate revival, until you grasp the things and not just grasp them, but get a taste of them, like I'm talking about today, until you've really experienced the depth of the forgiveness that comes from understanding how glorious and sinless and holy he is and how sinful we really are in accepting it and not glossing over it, not trying to justify it, not trying to say that it ain't that bad because so-and-so sins more than we do, but you really accept it and say, oh, what a wretched man I am. And then you expect experience the joy of his forgiveness and you experience that feeling of being washed as clean and white as snow, then man, you can't help go about out, out there and tell other people about it. That's when the corporate revival starts to kick in, right? So I pray through today's message and the worship that we experienced also a little bit earlier today, it was all like on a more somber tone to a degree today. I think that was on purpose, that God wants to experience the holiness of this moment and say like, man, th this is where we're at in this place in the fast and where we find ourselves today. And say, Lord, would you purge me? Would you purify me? This is for the believer and unbeliever alike in here today. If you have any ongoing sin in your life as a believer, it's time to hold on to God and not let go. The last little story that I had today it's found in Genesis 32, and it's that story of Jacob. So once you've come through this point, how do you hold on to it? How do you keep rekindling that fire? There was that moment, which we don't need to go through each of the individual scriptures on this one, but Jacob wrestles with God, right? And maybe that's where you find yourself today as a result of this message at this point of wrestling with God. Lord, I'm sinful, Lord. I've got issues. Lord, I've been trying to hold on to them, but I know I need to let go of them. Lord, would you come in? Would you purge me? Would you purify me? Would you remove these things? Would you ignite that fire? Would you burn off that stuff that's not supposed to be there? Would you help me come out stronger? Would you refine me in the refiner's fire this morning? Would you help me get through this? I'm not letting go until you do. Lord, I'm tired of my sin. I don't want it anymore. I'm tired of living this way. I don't want to wake up and do it again tomorrow, Lord. I truly want to be holy. If you're saying these kinds of things, that means the Holy Spirit is at work within you. That means that there is hope. That means that there's a great nation on the other side that he wants you to reach. That means that he wants to change your name. That means that he wants to use you. But you got to let him do the work. And you got to stay in the fight even when it feels like giving up. One of my jujitsu coaches is this guy named Elijah. I'll be gassed out, I'll be tired, I feel like I want to give up. And he's like, boy, you ain't dead yet. <laughs> like, God, I hate you, Elijah. <laughs> but I don't want to die and I feel like I'm going to die in just a minute. He'll come back to you and he'll say, at least you'll die when you're doing something you really love to do. <laughs> <laughs> don't give up. Keep up the fight. Keep wrestling. You know, in the midst of my addiction as a believer, as a believer, I would pray that, Lord, transform me, Lord. I don't want to do this again tomorrow. Lord, would you help me? Would you help me? I need that miracle. I, I, I would show up in church on Sunday. I would listen to the word. I would try to read the word throughout the week, but there was this stronghold in my life that kept drawing me back to it like a magnet that I hated about myself. I hated that I was stuck at that. I say, Lord, cleanse me, change me, restore unto me a right spirit, O oh God. And there came a day where he did. It was almost the second born again moment, July 31st, 1996. Came four years after that other salvation experience. So if you're a believer and you're still sinning, Hopefully, the Holy Spirit is messing up your sin. This very moment, I hope he is. I hope he's messing up your sin. Would you rise with me? I want to pray today before we go. We're actually finishing up a little bit early, it looks like today.
Oh, Lord, cast us not away from thy presence, O God. We find ourselves in the throne room of God this very morning. Imagine that you're at his feet. Have mercy on me, O God, for I am a sinner. I am in desperate need of a touch from you. Purge me of my sin and my transgressions. Lord, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against myself. I've sinned against others. And I don't know about you, but if you look at David's psalm in that first part, he acknowledged his sin before God. If that's you right now, whatever you're going through, whether you're not a believer and this is the first time you're praying a prayer like this or you are a believer and you really need God's help in some area of your life, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not gonna do anything weird today. It's between you and God. But acknowledge that sin before him, that sin that you want him to so desperately take away. What is it for you? Acknowledge it to him right now. He hears you. He knows. He knew it before you said it. Don't try to justify it. Don't try to make light of it. Feel the weight of your sin. Feel the weight of that pain. What are some of your deepest, darkest secrets? Reveal them to him right now. Lord, we acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge our pain and the depth of it. We acknowledge the separation that that's created. I suspect for some of you, you're not praying. You're not reading. If that's you, Father, forgive me. Father, forgive me for being like Adam and Eve and running and hiding, trying to cover up my transgressions. I come to you fully exposed this morning, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I don't deserve it. I'm dead in my trespasses and sin. For those of you who are believers and that fire seems to have burnt out, confess to your lukewarmness right now. Lord, I am lukewarm and I need you. Lord, would you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, blow wind on the embers that are still there and reignite them in my heart. Reignite them right now. Holy Spirit, blow through this room and reignite a fire that would burn away all of that sin. And Father, set people on fire once again, Lord Jesus. Cast me not away from thy presence, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Lord, would you renew that right spirit within the hearts of everyone who's here today, Lord Jesus. Fire them up. Get them excited, Lord Jesus. Transform their heart. Get them back to some of the basics. Prayer, fasting, studying the word, living a life of holiness, and watch what happens as they fan the flames of the spirit in their life. Father, restore joy this very moment. Restore freedom. Let them experience the forgiveness that is found in you. Father, as they walk from these rooms in a few minutes, Lord Jesus, would you just send them out there on mission? Lord, as we come here today and we acknowledge that our sins are forgiven, that we are being transformed and that we're going to continue to be transformed through this sanctification process, Lord, we do cry out and say, use me. Lord, use me. Let me share my testimony. Give me opportunities to go out there and share it with other people with the hope that they too would experience the forgiveness that we did. Lord, that they too might taste and see that you are good. I'm going to pray a little bit of a bold prayer. Mary Jo prayed this over me when I was in the midst of my addiction. And she said, when, if Eric should use would you make him sick, not to death, but would you get him sick unto the point where, you know, just doesn't agree with him in any way, shape, or form? And I'm speaking that over you. Should you continue in whatever your sin is, I pray that God will mess up your getting high. I pray that God will mess up your sinning, that you will get sick, not unto death, 
but that it would not be agreeable unto you. That, Lord, we would go out and be used to make a difference in the lives of others. That we as a transformed army of believers would get to experience revival, not only in our own lives, but revival in this church, revival in this city, revival in our nation and our world. That we would see an th- amazing move of God in our generation that would sweep the nations and that we would get to be a part of it in Jesus' name. And everybody says...